So thank you for, uh, for inviting me and uh, thank you for organizing this great workshop. Uh, I, I've known Stefan for, uh, well, since the late 80s, I think. And uh, you know, apart from scientific discussions, we had lots of uh, we had lots of discussions about life. You know, because we uh, we needed to make decisions at some point, staying in the U.S., going back to France. We had similar questions, uh, uh, qu you know, questions about uh, relationships too. Anyway, so we discussed about many things. Uh, we also uh, shared uh, a number of uh, brilliant uh, students, uh, Christophe Bernard, who's here. Uh, Goshen Yu also, uh, and uh, with Goshen uh, actually uh, la uh, much later than Christophe, we we, uh, we worked on uh, recognizing sounds, for instance, sounds from instrument from uh, space frequency textures. Okay, and I feel actually that's perhaps in part also what got Stefan interested in, in neural networks and th things like that. So happy birthday, Stefan, and I'm looking forward to the next 60 years, right? And uh, hopefully lots of uh, new, new good things too. So if you take an airplane, right? The airplane is certified as 10 to the minus nine per hour. Which means, by, that's not AI by the way, it's, it's uh, control systems and lots of things, but it's certified 10 to, to minus 9 per hour, which means that there's only one chance uh, in a billion that something really goes wrong in the next hour. Okay, that's how it's certified. Now, how, if, how about if you're coming on, on an airplane and, you know, uh, crossing the Atlantic or whatever, and being told, well, you know, uh, welcome aboard, I'm the captain, you'll be glad to know that the uh, control system for this aircraft was designed by the latest neural networks from, I won't say who, and as a result we have a 94% chance to actually land in San Francisco. <laughs> because that's the kind of thing we have at the moment with neural networks, okay? So it doesn't mean that, you know, we should just use control theory and everything uh, else, uh, but all these systems in the, in the aircraft has to be, uh, have to be at 10 to the minus 9 power or better, okay? So it doesn't mean we should uh, forget about all of this and just use uh, uh, classical techniques, but it means there's a bridge kind of to do to better have them uh, talk to each other. So, of course, a usual place of inspiration, the place of inspiration for neural networks is the brain, right? Uh, as its name indicates, which has about 100 billion neurons, and each of the neurons is about, about 10 to the 4 connections or synapses, right? So that's 10 to the 15 synapses. So if you, if you do a little règle de trois, right, it means that from the time a baby is born to the time she goes to college, she creates about a million new synapses every second. Every second, right? If you divide 10 to the 15 by 20 years. Okay. Uh, so the question is, what do you do with million synapses, right? Where, where, where is the information to create meaningfully these million synapses? Okay. And of course, it points to overparameterization and all sorts of other things, but uh, that's, uh, I think that's an important question. The other thing, we talked about sparsity, and we'll talk more about sparsity, but, you know, uh, so this is a, a cartoon I made out of a thing in a book and things I added. But, so you have lots of feedback loops in the brain, right? And if you take the thalamus, which is a uh, nucleus where all of the sensory information, uh, except smell, has to go before it reaches the cortex, uh, and you look at just the anatomy of this thing, you'll see that only 5% of the connections is sensory data, is data, right? So everything else is feedback loops, okay? Similarly, if you look at a particular cell in the cortex, most of uh, what it's connected to doesn't come from the thalamus, but it comes from neighboring cells. So it's a little as if you have this huge a system made of uh, 10 to the 11 fill elements, co uh, you know, connected by 10 to the 15 synapses. But it's a, it's a little as if the normal state of this system is to dream, okay, or to do something like dreaming, okay? And from time to time, you constrain it very sparsely with reality, right? That's the data, okay? But the system is that, right? It's these millions of feedback loops, okay? Um, so, and the other thing, of course, is the brain is doing everything with 20 watts, right? It doesn't need to settle big uh, plants near uh, electrical power dams, you know, whatever to do 
to pre-compute uh, models for to pre-train models for uh, language or so it does things with 20 watts and with desperately slow components right neurons react 10 million times slower than transistors okay still you know for most things the brain uh, is much better than you know uh, what we do even with large language models, certainly it gives the more uh, correct answers. Uh, and it's also much better at the basketball, right, at any robots that we bring, that we have built so far, although it's dealing with these desperately slow components, okay? So it's, but it's still much better at real-time motion, okay? So it means we have lots of things to, understand, to try to understand, right? Uh, so what's the place of uh, human machine learning, uh, control theory or systems theory, neuroscience and so on, and how do they all interact? Okay. Something, actually, uh, we talked a little about that also this morning. We have a strange, uh, strange uh, situation now where you have all these large language models, right? And so it looks like we've solved, quote, the language problem before solving motion control, right? In biology, you know, language came very, very late. You know, intelligence is really the effect of refining sensory motor control and getting better and better at sensory motor control, you know. And at some point you start doing planning and at some point might, maybe even you get language and actually language speech is itself a sensory motor control problem, right? The articulating precisely and so on. Uh, so, um, so we are in this strange situation where we seem to have completely uh, said to evolution, uh, we don't care about evolution. N now, of course, this creates its problems, right? Because as you haven't built these things from qualitative physics, uh, you know, dropping things, uh, common sense and so on, these, language pro these languages will tell you very, very confidently things which are totally wrong. Okay. And so, it, but it's an interesting question, you know, in some sense, you know, we, we were saying, you know, all what we've said about, you know, building robots following evolution and so on, maybe we can do language first, you know, maybe we can do intelligence first. And so I don't believe that, but, uh, but uh, you know, but so that's an interesting question. So, so, but what's plausible is that we lose a lot by jumping directly into language before qualitative physics and motion control and all these things. Uh, so, we'll just talk about one set of tools to try to understand some small part of these problems, which is something we've been developing uh, in the last uh, 20 years or so, or more, 25 actually now, uh, which we call contraction, which has, you know, history uh, also in other parts of math, uh, and uh, which is work I did uh, uh, with, uh, we, we did with a very, very brilliant uh, student named uh, Winnie Lumiller, and he was good at everything, and in particular, he was good at fluids. He is, actually. And um, we wondered, you know, Lyapunov theory, which is kind of the standard tools to look at nonlinear systems analysis, is basically virtual mechanics, okay? You build virtual energies and things like that, and so on. And so we wondered whether you could do things more like virtual fluids, okay? So in a sense, it's like saying, you know, let's think of Lyapunov and Riemann kind of uh, joining forces, you know, because if you start about f talk about fluids, you can start thinking about metrics and things like that, differential motion. And so what can be shown is that if you wonder whether a system like this, where x is the state, right, uh, x dot is the derivative, and you have some nonlinear function of the state and time, it could be open loop, closed loop, and so on. If you wonder whether a system like that is contracting in the sense that any two solutions of the systems converge exponentially towards each other, you can show the main result is that this is true if and only if the Jacobian of the system, so in other words, the linearization of the system, but everywhere, okay, is negative definite in some metric, okay. So not by itself negative definite, but negative definite some metric. So at the beginning, we and I were wondering, you know, uh, how come we pr can prove things based on linearization? Everybody knows that linearization doesn't say anything about an only system. Well, linearization at the point doesn't say anything about an only system, right? But linearization everywhere I is like having an only system, right? If you have the value of the function at some point and then linearization everywhere, then actually you, it's exactly knowing the function, right? So you have this result that, you know, this is a, if and only if it's negative, if it's in some metric. So what does it mean? We, are, we don't have time to go through the math, but basically you, what you play with is a differential displacement, the same thing you have in fluids and the same thing you have also in optimal control at fixed time. 
and you do a differential transformation, theta. And this transformation doesn't have to be integrable, so in other words, it doesn't need to exist in explicit z. And you compute the corresponding Jacobian, the Jacobian transform modulo this metric theta transpose theta, and that's what you get. And you can show these basic results out of this analysis. So just to show that, you know, this gives you a slightly different style of doing things than usual, if you take a Lorentz system, so a Lorentz system is the poster system of something which is not contracting, right? It's a system which is chaotic. Uh, you have sensitivity to initial conditions, uh, meaning in, uh, local instability, right? Suppose you measure x, and you're very lazy, you try to build an observer, a predictor for the system, and you just copy y and z, you call them y hat and zi, and you wonder whether this thing is going to converge to that thing. All right, so you're trying to build what's called an observer in nonlinear systems, right? So the measurement is x. Well, you can see that if you take the Jacobian of the system with an identity metric, you simply get this, which is obviously negative definite, right? All these coefficients are positive, right? So this is obviously negative definite, and therefore this observer converges exponentially to the real Lorentz system with a rate which is the minimum of 1 and beta. And this is the entire proof, right? And it's a global result, right? It's starting anywhere. You converge exponentially towards, uh, towards the, the real thing. And because it's exponential, it's also robust. So in other words, you start adding disturbance and so on. Although the system is chaotic, it's still going to be, do a pretty good job at converging to x hat and z hat. So you can show also that these contracting systems have nice aggregation property. If you pile them up, they work like Lego blocks. Okay? So basically, you can build more and more complex contracting systems out of contracting sub-elements by simply following simple rules. And we kind of also said before the word evolvability was, uh, was invented that we suspected that actually evolution is using these kind of ideas as well uh, because, you know, when you pile up new functionalities, you don't have to have to redo the entire, you know, stability, uh, have to do with deals to stability each time you pile up a new functionality. Okay. Uh, incidentally, uh, you know, you may be f familiar with the classical work of Herb Simon, you know, on the architecture of complexity. And in some sense, you know, uh, this could be seen as a sort of formalization of some of these ideas. Uh, actually, uh, you know, making quanti quantifi quantifying them. Uh, you can show that if you have a contracting system driven by periodic input, it actually tends towards something periodic uh, with the same period, although the function is completely nonlinear. Okay. Uh, robustness will come back to. We were talking about symmetries, right? So uh, you can show that if you have a, a function which is equivariant and contracting, then basically you're transferring symmetries from the dynamics to the trajectories because, because it's contracting, it means the initial conditions don't matter. So if it's equivariant, x of t will tend towards gamma x, right? So in other words, you'll transform the equivariance of the dynamics automatically into the symmetry of the trajectory, okay? And you can apply that to, uh, you know, things with time too. Uh, and you can apply this with things purely in time, which is this result, actually. You transfer the periodicity of the input to periodicity of this uh, solution. So you can express things in terms of generalized Jacobians, or you can express things in terms of metrics. These are equivalent results, this saying this and this in terms of metric theta transpose theta is this. In terms of metric, you can rewrite this, uh, the, um, the, this equation and the fact that the geodesic distance between any two trajectories with respect to this metric decreases exponentially. Okay. So the minimum distance, if you want, expressed, measured as, uh, in terms of this metric decreases exponentially. You can show that these systems are robust. So if you have a system and a perturbed system, then the, 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 the dynamics of the, the unperturbed system would be the black thing. With the perturbed, it has this extra term. And therefore, you can easily see that if this extra term tends to zero asymptotically, then so does the, uh, the, the distance between the two trajectories, the geodesic distance. And actually, even this, is this thing is just L2, that's also the case. So now, how do we make this term 
tends to zero asymptotically, so basically we have the same structure, uh, the same behavior as if there was no disturbance. Well, if the disturbance is a certain structure, it's the subject of adaptive control. So, in other words, you can have your Lego systems and adaptive controller for each of these systems. So what does this mean? So suppose, for instance, we have a dynamics f of b plus b of x times u, u is a control. This would work with prediction just as well. And you have a bunch of basis functions times unknown parameters a. So suppose you choose the control law to make the closed loop nominal dynamics nice, for instance, contracting, and to cancel as best as possible these unknown terms a. Okay, y is known, a is unknown, so you put y a hat. So you build a, a Lyapunov-like function, uh, and this, uh, this v could be a nominal Lyapunov, closed-loop Lyapunov function. It could be a, a precisely a, a geodesic distance. Later on, we'll see applications to optimal control. And you take a quadratic term in the parameter estimation error, which of course you don't know. And you can show that if you have an adaptive law of this form, then the system converges to exactly the same behavior as if you had just used y a here, although you don't know a at all. Okay. So in other words, it learns about a hat to converge to a in a fashion that makes the task work. Okay. Now, it's, it's very, it does this in a very economical fashion. In other words, like James Mon, it learn, it's learns on a need-to-know basis. It learns just enough about the parameters to get the task done. In other words, it's not a that conver it's not a hat that converges to a, it's y a hat that converges to y a. All right. And so if you think of it, if you have a robot sitting there and you don't want to move, you do nothing. You're not going to learn any about the anything about the parameters, right? But if you want to move very in a very complicated way with a with a load, then you'll have to learn the parameters exactly. The same adaptive control law will do the both. Okay, so you have this learning on the need to the basis. From an optimization point of view, what's interesting also is that you can rewrite the same equation as a gradient descent on the parameters, not on v zero, but on v dot zero. Okay, so in other words, on how this nominal v changes with time. And that's again consistent with the idea that you learn just enough to get the task done. Okay. And so these things work very well, and, and you get really uh, quick adaptation, uh, almost transparent adaptation, real time online in such systems. Okay, and uh, you know, and you can uh, for, so for instance, the basic function you may know them, or you may, if you if you love neural networks, you could use the first n minus one layers of a network to construct the basis function, and this is becomes then the nth layer, which is adaptive. Okay. Uh, so, suppose we now apply contraction for time invariant systems to gradient descent. So, obviously, saying that the, the Jacobian of this system is negative definite is exactly equivalent to saying that the function is strictly convex. Okay? So, in other words, saying that gradient descent is contracting in an identity metric is exactly equivalent to saying that the function is strictly convex. However, for gradient descent, to converge to a unique global minimum, it could be contracting in any metric. It doesn't have to be the identity metric, right? So in other words, contracting the convexity of the function is a set of measure zero in all the things that tend toward a unique minimum. Because this has, just to, has to be contracting in any metric, okay? State-dependent metric. Uh, so I could, given the time, I'll probably pass on this. But of course, the combination properties then can be used to, if you think of uh, hierarchies, the combination we had, uh, the combinations were parallel hierarchies, feedback, you know, hierarchy is like back prop, right? And feedback will be like Nash games or, or actually RL. So, so we saw that already. Suppose that you have a gradient descent or a natural gradient descent which is semi-contracting. In other words, in the previous equations, you know, you may remember uh, m dot plus a transpose m plus a m a less than minus lambda m, uh, lambda was the contraction rate. You have lambda equals zero. So it just says that the distances, the geodesic distances don't increase. Okay, they don't necessarily decrease exponentially, they just don't increase, okay? So suppose you have that, 
And you know, this is a natural gradient service, M could be identity, but uh, it's not the same metric as the contracting system. So assume gradient descent is semi-contracting in some metric, then all trajectories will tend towards a global minimum. This global minimum in general will not be unique, of course, because it's just semi-contracting, so this is, uh, this, is this is meant for over-parameterized systems, right? And between any two global minima, there will be a path which is itself composed of global minima. And of course, if you have three things like that, it means there will be a whole convex hull of, of these things, okay? So, in other words, yeah, tendons, thank you. Uh, so, in other words, uh, if you have a c contraction in any metric, then you tend towards a unique minimum. If you have semi-contraction in any metric, you tend towards this topology where you tend towards this valley of minima and they all have the same cost. All right? And this is completely general. And there's a conjecture, maybe some people here might want to, to, to prove that, is that as dimension increases, the fact that it's semi-contracting in some metric becomes easier and easier because the dimension of the metric varies as n squared. Right? So, in other words, it becomes less and less constraint. Okay. okay. So, we have examples of that, and the metric doesn't need to be integrable, but I don't think I have time to talk about this. So, this can be used for adaptive control. This can be used for adaptive prediction. Let's just remember for the moment the structure of the parameter update. We had A versus alpha, right? We had a gain matrix, a matrix of basis functions, and an error signal. Now, if you look at Feynman's lecture on physics, you know, uh, at some point he has this very nice kind of side remark where he says, you know, might have wondered why in all the equations I told you about, you know, they always involve gradients, rotationals, divergence, you know, whether we're talking about electromagnetism or, uh, or fluids or whatever, we always have the same operators, okay? And why should this be the case? And he basically says in the, in the simpler language, because this is an undergrad, because these should all be tensors, okay? Basically, you should, you should, they should all be coordinate invariant. And the number of equations that you can write with differential operators, which should be co coordinate invariant, is much, much smaller than the number of equations you can write with differential operators, right? So, uh, so uh, this, uh, um, so he's so saying basically these things have to be vectors. Okay? So you can take this idea and kind of flip it around and say, okay, so suppose we have a system and either we're not very good at modeling or we were very lazy or it's just a very unknown system and we just have a bunch of posi possible physical models but don't, we don't know which one is relevant. Okay? How can we deal with that? Well, we can use sparsity but not in the way that was dis discussed before. We can use sparsity to find the relevant physical model and in the process it's parameters too. Right? And the others will disappear. Okay? So, a tri uh, trivial uh, example, if you want, uh, so, sorry, a trivial example, I'll come back to that, would be if you have a, a set of chemical equations, right, four, four terms, but you don't know what the equations are. You just know there are four chemicals, right? That you can say, well, you know, I have four chemicals interacting, I'm going to put all the monomials in there, and I'll let sparsity dis describe, the, choose the right, the right chemicals, okay? And this works really well, but how do you put sparsity while preserving uh, the stability of this overall system? Because the whole key is that you know, it converges really fast and you need to know basis and so on. So you, it's, it's really relying on its stability proof, right? On, the, on the, the fact that you have a stability net around this thing. Okay? So you cannot use regularization as usual, you know, but you can, what you can use is implicit regularization. Okay? And what you can show is that if in the Lyapunov like function that you have, you have your error term, the, 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 the task error term, and normally you have a quadratic term in parameter error, if you replace this quadratic term by a Bregman divergence, then you automatically have the same structure as you had before, but simply with the gain matrix in the quadratic term replaced by the inverse of the Hessian of the convex function used to construct the Bregman divergence. Okay, remember the Bregman divergence is basically the discrepancy between a function, its linearization at a point. Okay. So, what does it say? It says, if this inverse is easy to compute, 
then it's very easy to do that. But you might say, why do that? Because you can show that if you do that, then actually, out of this, all the parameters that get y a hat minus y a tend to 0, it will choose the one that minimizes the convex function used to define the, the Bregman divergence. Okay? And so if you're interested in implementing sparsity, you're going to pick this convex function to be L1 or maybe L1.01 for smoothness, right? You're going to pick L1. You're going to do this. The Jacobian is very easy to compute because you know, it's diagonal. The, the, the gain matrix is very easy to compute, and it's inverse because it's diagonal. And automatically, out of all the parameters that will work, you'll select a sparse set that does exactly the job as well. Okay? Uh, and the only change computationally is that you replace this P matrix by this inverse Hessian. Okay. So if we take our, our chemical system again, this is a toy example, right? But you apply it, and it, this is real time, right? Immediately you see that most of the parameters learned are zero, and you just learn a few parameters. Okay. So, so you can do, so you can have. Uh, adaptation, you can implement sp sparsity um, you know, implicitly. You can use actually other uh, regularizations like entropic cost, for instance. And you can also apply this, we said, to Lyapunov functions, to contraction, uh, to geodesic distances in the contraction metric. And you can also apply it to some kinds of optimal control. Okay. Uh, including perhaps some kinds of RL and, uh, and uh, MPC and so on. Okay. So let, let's make the simplest case, right? If you have uh, that, a cost to go, right? A cost to go in a, in a minimization problem, the cost to go is a layup on a function, right? By definition, something that keeps decreasing and so on, right? So because of that, we can automatically do what we said before. We have the nominal Lyapunov function. We can say now we had optimized this thing to go somewhere, right? Now the parameters are all changed. What do we do? Well, we just add this one line of code, right? Mm -hmm. And now it's going to converge to the same thing, but with these unknown parameters. Okay. And there's a subtlety, which I don't have time to talk about this now, is that actually you don't even need the structure y hat minus a. You could just have actually uh, uh, something which does, uh, which depends, no, you don't need YA, right? You can have something that depends non-linearly on, non on the parameters, but that's something else. Uh, don't have time to talk about that, or about that, or about that, fine. Uh, so, how much time do you have? Two minutes. Two minutes, good. So, since, since this is IH, uh, the SOS, you know, I thought I had to talk about something a little uh, more, uh, Technical. So we, we, we did something recently about uh, contraction in Banach spaces, right? So in other words, in spaces which are still complete, but you don't have a dot product. Okay, and you can show that actually it extends very, very easily. Well, by, by mathematical standards, right? So basically, these become weighted Banach, spa Banach spaces, right? So in other words, this theta that we had before becomes, uh, you know, defines the Banach space, right? And then everything works, right? So basically, uh, so weighted by spaces and nat natural generalization of contraction metrics to spaces without it in the product. The main result extends exponential rates, combination, virtual system, I didn't have time to talk, synchronization, symmetries. You can apply this to very classical problems, you know, it's like viscosity solutions. Right? So you have vanishing viscosity solutions. So obviously, an obvious thing is, you know, instead of vanishing viscosity, you can have vanishing contraction, right? You add a metric. So, so far it's fairly obvious, and it already makes viscosity solutions much more general. But actually, you can, you can show that you can do much more than that. That basically you can extend these kind of ideas to anything with a bounded expansion rate. Okay, so it doesn't have even to be contracting, it just has to be a bounded expansion rate. Okay? Uh, and so, uh, that works very nicely too. Uh, you can show in some cases, existence and uniqueness of time-independent problems using time-varying contraction. Okay, so for instance, if you have, in the classical case, uh, the ODE case, x dot plus phi of x equal a, right? And the system is contracting. It's really solving the equation f of x equal a, right? Because it tends towards an equilibrium, right? 
But if you apply that to PD, now you start getting things which are not known, right? Because uh, uh, you can, uh, you know, uh, uh, what's in retrospect, you know, there's very little tools to look at stabilities for PD or at least classical tools. You know, Lyapunov exponents don't really work, or at least they work only for the discretization and so on. Well, contraction rates are work directly. Okay, so, but that's, uh, okay. so those of you are interested, uh, paper published uh, January uh, 2023. Okay, I think I managed that. Any questions for Jean-Jacques? I see one. Yes. Uh, the, the, there is a, a, a great difficulty in actually deciding whether there is a metric which makes the system. So you have a... Yes, very good question. Very good question. So first of all, uh, you have these Lego properties. So in other words, if you're capable of building your system out of simpler components where you know the metrics, and you build this progressively a very large system, then you automatically know the metric. Okay. So that's one thing. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the other uh, is uh, there may be good physical reasons. You know? So for instance, in robotics, you know, the inertia matrix is a classical suspect and so on, right? So it may be uh, good physical reasons to compute the metric. The last point is that if you really have to do it numerically or partly numerically, uh, at least it's linear, okay? So in other words, the equation defining the metric, this A is Jacobian, right? So everything is state dependent and so on, but it's an LMI still, right? So uh, it's, uh, you know, it doesn't mean it's trivial to solve, but it's, it's much easier to solve than if it was just a random uh, equation. Last thing is something we're playing a little now. We're wondering whether you can use Ricci flows to this fine metrics. Okay? You, they, you basing, use, uh, using the latest result on uh, PDs. Right? <coughs> Any more questions? Yes. Yeah, so uh, you have very general uh, conditions now uh, for convergence by being able to completely choose this metric. And of course, there is this $1 million problem, which is understanding the convergence of stochastic gradient descent yes. on, uh, on these uh, neural networks, uh, mm -hmm. let's say more than two million layers. Yeah. And you were referring in, indirectly to, to learning. Uh, yes, so, so, okay. What do you think you can say something about this so, problem with that kind of approach? I, I think so, the, 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 at least the, the, the intuitively, right? So, so first of all, the, the, the stochastic gradient descent, right? So we know the stochastic part kind of smooths out the cost, right? So in a sense, in terms of getting rid of local minima and so on, the stochastic is much easier, right? Uh, so there's this part. So this says then, this is says, well, you know, a cost will, will converge to a global minimum by definition has no local minima, right? But it's saying if you can get rid somehow of the problem of local minima, perhaps by using stochastic gradient, which is kind of smoothing the cost and therefore allowing you to avoid these minima most of the time, then you'll get exactly the topology that you have in deep learning. In other words, you have tons of solutions and all of these solutions will minimize your cost. Okay, and they will all be path connected by solutions which also minimize the cost. Then out of these solutions, you can perhaps add an extra diffusion or so, maybe like uh, Tishby would have liked to do, uh, to get better generalization, for instance, right? But here it says, you know, you have exact, if, if you somehow get rid of local minima, perhaps by, you know, stochastic gradient, the, the smoothing effect of stochastic gradient descent, then basically you get exactly the same topology that you have in deep networks, right? Lots of good minima and all path connected by good minima, okay? And then you want to find the best from the point of view of regularization, yeah, exactly. Um, I do have one question. Yes. Um, in yeah, thank you for allowing me to clarify. Actually. In, this, um, in this framework, and this also goes to stochasticity, um, is this contractive framework sort of robust to small amounts of noise uh, in the, you know, like maybe like changing the confusion a little bit? Uh, yeah, so, so we also have stochastic contraction and so on. We, we've studied these kinds of things, you know, it can, can, you can show results on the trace of the effect of the noise, you know, which is, uh, uh, and so on, yeah, so, uh, you know, we, we can, uh, we, we, we have stochastic results and so, but we, we know that anyway it should be robust because you have this exponential convergence, right? right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, 
Um, okay, let's thank uh, those up here.